Welcome. Aloha. This is Think Tech Hawaii, and today's Thursday, October 7th, 2021. You are watching a weekly discussion show, uh, and that is Politics for the People. And I am your show host, Stephanie Stoll Dalton. In this show, we're discussing a political paradox, is one way to describe it. That is, Democrats having won elections in the House, Senate, presidency, are unable to enact their agenda or to make and pass laws, most of which the entire nation approves or supports. At the same time, the national election losing Republicans threaten and cheat to move their agenda forward, preach deadly misinformation to believing citizens, push dirty tricks leading to debt ceiling brinkmanship and other proposals and obstruct any traction Democrats gain. Sadly enough, this tyrannical minority position they have is winning one way. And that certainly we can see immediately in tanking the president's polls. So if we look at the picture, you see the, the photo of the recent polls showing in three categories that, uh, that, that Biden is down. So, I mean, we can see this, I think, but as far as coronavirus and the economy are concerned, he's down. And especially for the economy, which is, uh, is, is very interesting as to why this is happening. So let's talk about how the sources of power are playing uh, in these uh, risky, as well as, as we've described it, unruly times of governing in our nation. So I, our show guests are here today to discuss and analyze these topics. And I wanna welcome uh, Jay Fidel and Tim Apicello. So welcome guys, here we go. So Morning. what do you think um, these recent polls tell us about our leader, that his use of power. What, what, it, what, it, what is that telling us to see those numbers, especially for the first two? We know that immigration is very difficult and is a whole nother topic on its own, but for the first two, what, what does that say, Jay, to you? Well, it, may, it makes me question polls, sorry. <clears throat> you know, first of all, you, you don't know uh, who they're talking to, how they're developing the sample, how they're framing the question. Um, you don't, you don't know whether the poll is really worthy. Um, and um, the, the second is uh, polls in general, you know, reflect uh, maybe a naivete in the part of the public uh, or a uh, worse yet, a, um, a, a mindset by the media that, that creates public opinion that is um, unwarranted. And I think all of that is in play here. Uh, but, but I think to the extent in general that that Biden doesn't look so good to the pollsters on these issues and on his management in general. Um, it's because of A, he's, he's not a forceful personality, I'm sorry. And B, he's, as any president, especially in these troubled times, he's going to run into snafus every now and then, maybe more often these days, it seems like. And C, he's got the Republicans who's only his only mission it is, is to discredit him. And they waste no moment, okay? Uh, they discredit him on everything, justified or not justified. And they got it going. Um, they're creating, um, you know, a whole community of, of, uh, of criticism. And I think that's having an effect. You know, Tim, Jay used the descriptor of not a forceful personality. For, for the president's approach. What do you think about that? Is that something that is- Well, he, he is pretty mellow um, when his approach to conflict. Um, you know, you can see the gears grinding internally. Um, you know, he, he got a lot done when he was in Congress and the Senate. Uh, he has a certain style of working with his fellow uh, uh, politicians. Uh, he has a certain negotiation style. It's not my style. Um, I'm a little more direct, and uh, I don't think he is all that direct. Uh, he likes to work behind the scenes, I think. Um, these polls reflect also a moment in time. I'm sure the coronavirus poll numbers are reflective of those who are not happy with a mandate for vaccination that he, he took uh, the baton with and moved it forward. That was a fairly 
a bold thing to do. Um, so for a president that's not known for his boldness, that, that was an action that he did. And you know, that's reflecting the poll numbers. A lot of people don't like that. Well, my answer to them is too bad. And then if you look at uh, the economy, well, that's a moment in time picture snapshot. And I, I suspect when the infrastructure deals get done, uh, that snapshot will look quite different when polls are taken about how they feel about the economy. Um, immigration, yeah, that's a nightmare. And um, he is directly responsible for that. Uh, he did a lot of mixed messaging when he first came in as president, uh, giving an indication, come on in. And now um, that's not the message. And where is uh, Vice President Harris on immigration and the border issues? Nowhere to be found. So uh, he, he deserves the dings that he's getting in the immigration numbers. I think the other two numbers will, will change around and they'll be more favorable to Joe Biden in the near future. Yeah, don't forget Afghanistan. Afghanistan hurt him bad. Yeah, well, that's and, a separate uh, poll number. <laughs> and I think yeah. it, was, it was separate. It was it was justified in that. I mean, uh, it's, it's still unraveling or unfolding. <laughs> I'm not I'm not sure which applies, um, but you know, he he could have done a better job, and and that goes to exactly what his relation it relationship is his command relationship with the military and the Joint Chiefs. Yeah, yeah. somebody somebody made a, a few mistakes in there, and yeah. of course he's the guy that has to take the heat for it. And, you know, Jay, I agree with that because, you know, when you have an overall feeling for somebody that spills over into the direct questions in polling, uh, it taints, um, it taints the, the response you're going to get because you have a general feeling about the individual and, and the job they're doing. And it just, you can't help but paint um, the response to specific questions in a poll. All right, you know, the, you guys the unfair aspect of this Right, but before is, that, we... is that people do not, when they make these uh, judgments of him, they do not have in mind what would have happened, what would be happening now if our friend Donald were around, because yes. it would be incredibly worse. Yes, exactly my point. The other being that no matter what way you did that thing, no matter what info you had and what decisions, judgments you made, it was never going to go through nicely. Okay. And the one thing we were spared, which I didn't expect to be spared, was I don't think they really gave a darn about that gate. And only that creep that got out of prison the other day did. He could get at it fast. It was a target he could make. They wanted one of those planes down. They wanted one of those planes with 800 people on them to go down, and they didn't do that. So I think that there may be a backstory to talk about with that, about what, whether, how, how they did try to protect for that, because it could have been so much worse. And um, anyway, so what do you think, Jay? Finish your point there about it, because I just don't think there was a perfect way to do it. It just would not have ever gone off as a smooth road. No, I mean, we live in very difficult times. And, um, you know, I don't think people really, um, you know, uh, incorporate in what, what kind of a mess Trump left behind. We've talked about that before. I mean, he left time bombs all over the highway here, uh, all over the world. He screwed up our relationship with our allies, and, and Biden has to repair that. But it, it leaves a bad taste, doesn't it? Look what happened to uh, Macron and and withdrawing the uh, you know French consul, rather ambassador from Washington over the the Australian deal, which was not handled all that well. Sorry, it's like it's like Biden is missing things, but he's working on a a hostile environment. You know, he and Trump set a lot of that up. And so Sam it's, this is not like an ordinary transition. We're not really finished with the transition because uh, Trump a uh, left him these time bombs and, you know, mm, yeah. problems to deal with. And B, you know, things happen. Things yeah. happen now. And, 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 and Biden, okay. you know, is um, in, in many ways, you know, he's not forceful enough to do the job that has to be done. He should be more forceful. You know, I was telling you before the show, Eugene Robinson, a commentator from the uh, Wall Street Journal, uh, was going on, on on cable last night. I never heard him speak so so strongly, uh, saying that Biden really had to be forceful. And uh, you know, whether he does it right or wrong, he has to speak to us 
He has to take positions. He can't be Mr. Nice Guy all the time. And yeah, we've well, talked about that so often here. Yeah. It, you know, it, it, it really it really is uh, increasingly the case. And it's probably a big part of these polls. Well, you know, Tim, I think uh, Jay's uh, got a point we can pick up again, but I'd like to shift over to the legislative process. Um, now to talk about that because as i've been looking at it it resembles to me the spartacus chariot races <laughs> remember in the movie where you had 10 horses <laughs> as a charioteer to manage so what thinking about that legislative process you know who are the strong horses in that process and and who's who's handling them the best can you give that a crack to see uh, if yeah i can give you a crack at it if you're a gop side it's mitch mcconnell he he's <laughs> been her uh, no. On the Democratic side, you've got uh, someone with a harp in the in the chariot, uh, <laughs> plucking notes as the horses are, are, are wildly going, running in the wrong direction. Um, I, I'm sorry, but okay. But if it's Mitch McConnell, then what was the blink today? Okay, well he blinked. Yeah, I mean he he saw that it wasn't going to go in his direction, and ultimately his strategy would make the GOP party look bad. But here's the thing about Mitch McConnell: he realizes a screw up, and he can he can tact very quickly to adjust to it and 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 no one will remember it. Um, that's that's again, I'm sorry, but the Democrats, they don't know how to fight like Republicans. And I've said this a hundred times, you know, that's the greatest thing that Democrats ever did was bring the Lincoln project on board and have them do their ads because oh, yeah. only a Republican knows how to fight like a Republican. And they're all Republicans or ex-Republicans. And the bottom line is the Democrats, when it comes to the legislative uh, abilities, uh, on last show I said uh, I, I, I conjured up the name of Tip O'Neill, and I'll I'll give his quote again, and that is, you know, when a freshman uh, congressman would come in from the House, he call him in a room and say, if you want to get along, you're going to go along, and it was you know it was really with an iron fist, not checking in with your emotions and your feelings and you know what would make you feel better it's i got business to get done i have an agenda to accomplish and you're gonna be part of the process or else i'm gonna put you on the back 40 for your four-year term or two-year term excuse well, me okay well jay does, does mcconnell in that blank does mcconnell show a way for dems to take out to date to make some major moves the kind not of in their dna i'm sorry it's not in their dna um, no, but, no, but let's go back to the blink itself. Yeah. What what blink? You know, that's a that's a media term. It's catchy. Um, to me, it's uh, this is inconsequential blink. He didn't really blink at all. He he did one of his McConnell look over the horizon strategies is what he did. So that won't be now. It'll be in December. We'll have the same thing back again. He'll do it all over again. He's but, just reserving a little time. He but, gave us a thrill for a few weeks. And this blink is only a delay. That's all it is. We're going to be back in the same soup soon. Well, the blink, the blink was for political ads in the 2022 election. That's what the blink was for. It's actually, I think he drew us in. He drew the Democrats in. Um, bottom line is, if the Democrats don't get the infrastructure bills done before December, uh, they're in a world of hurt. But does it not show that there are reasons McConnell will move? And, and the reason is if he's going to, if the Dems are getting too close to actually taking that, uh, taking the filibuster. I wish I could agree with that. Um, I, I think, I think that sometimes he will do a feint, F-E-I-N-T, mm -hmm. a change up, yeah. you know, so that, uh, and you don't know which way he's moving. Oh, it's part of his general strategy of keeping everything discombobulated, and it all has a purpose. Even if it seems to be conciliatory, it's not. Okay. I mean, the man is focused on his own power and his own strategy. Don't be fooled. Well, I wanted to hear what you thought that showed about McConnell. You're saying not to be fooled that he's just playing the... Well, it's kind of the opposite of Wolf, but coming, you know, I'll I'll respond to your pushing on getting close to doing something about the filibuster and pretend like that that's something I care about. But in fact, isn't it? And will he not do that him his own self when they get in the majority? And also, what how would it how could it be done right now? Um, Tim, do you know if Biden actually can do it? Is it just the cinema and the 
and the mansion um, a disagreement that keeps us from having the filibuster taken out? Well, again, the filibuster pertaining to what? If the filibuster to be modified pertaining to the debt ceiling, I think you can get 50 votes for that uh, from the Democrats. And I think Manson may actually agree with that. Uh, who knows where cinema is? I mean, she's out in the planet. Well, she's with, planet, she's with uh, Manson. Wherever she is. She's well, not Manchin. on everything. She sounds like she's on Planet Crouton half the time. Um, yeah. I don't know where she's at. And I don't think anyone knows where she's at. But the bottom line is, if, if the filibuster is specific to debt um, ceiling uh, elimination or the vote for that, I think you would have, I think, again, you'd have 50 votes for that on the Democrats. Democratic side. Uh, I would like to add that the debt ceiling is just a, it's um, it's a spurious issue. Yeah, it's I agree. Gonna, it's I agree. going to get resolved. We have so many mo more and more important issues that are that don't have a prayer. I, I you know, um, you you should ask us, Stephanie, about uh, infrastructure and how that's going to work, if at all. And, well, and even you know, if you ask, for example. Uh, Manchin, will he waive the filibuster uh, for the Senate's vote on infrastructure? The answer is no, he's not. Right. He's made that clear. So, but, the, so it's, it's not going to happen without him. But Jay, in the filibuster situation, okay, I mean, in the um, reconciliation, is it not M McConnell is smarter even so because there's only so many reconciliation packet passages that you can have. And so what McConnell's doing in this quote blank thing is he's trying to get the Democrats to use up one of their reconciliations on that. Okay, is if that if you agree with that, I want so to don't, don't forget you can't pass it in the Senate without a majority vote filibuster or no filibuster, you need yeah. at least majority vote. You can't well, get a majority vote with Manchin oh. and Cinema. Oh, okay. Well, I'm saying if he did get the Democrats to line up, can, can and it, will he lose, is, Man, is McConnell trying to take away one of the reconciliations by not doing any lifting or any help at all on the debt ceiling, okay? So that way he can draw them in, they use up a reconciliation opportunity. How does that affect, then here's your question about the infrastructure, Jay. Then how, do, where does that put the infrastructure? They're not gonna use one up. But if that's the only way to get the debt ceiling down, they're not going to use one up. Period. They're going to they're going to use their mulligan. They're going to use their reconciliation for the infrastructure. It's pure and simple, and I think it's going to get done before December. So that's that takes that one off the table. They're not going to use one up just for the debt structure. They're not that stupid. Well, McConnell has given the reconciliation way or the regular way. Yeah, the well, it's going to have to be the regular way because they're not going to use it up. They but can't the, afford to waste it. But the um, right way is to put a number on it, and they don't want to put a number on it. Well, That's we're something. going nowhere with this. You know, every day it drones on. It's like, it, it's like every day is like the day before, and we get no closer to it. I mean, it's horrendous that the Democrats are fighting with themselves. It's, it's horrendous that, uh, that McConnell is sworn not to let this get through. And you know what? It was a huge tactical error by both Pelosi and um, Biden. I agree uh, with that. To think that they could link these two. They can't, they won't. McConnell will never let them do it. And they'll have to collapse on it. And, and, one, of the, and one of the big things I think that people are concerned with in evaluating Biden's performance here is he can't get his bills through. You can hear it over and over again every day, it's going nowhere. And I mean, you gotta blame him, his strategy is, not good. Linking them was a bad strategy. Okay, Tim, what? Let me just address what Jay said. I agree with Jay uh, totally about linking the, the two together was a bad, bad strategy. But if you recall in, in history, the Affordable Care Act was declared dead umpteen times before it was approved. And I think we're in a similar si uh, situation with the infrastructure bill. It's been declared a nightmare and nothing's coming together. Again, I, I'll, I'll eat my humble pie, but infrastructure is going to get done. Now, okay, well, now I'm, on the, record, I'm on the record for $1.75 trillion on the second package. I'm You're on the still record. there? You're still at $1.75? I am. The uh, infrastructure or the yep. other? Well, the the 1.2 passes in the House. The 3.5 gets whittled down to 1.75. It passes. 
Okay, and then and it might then, even be a little higher, but I'm gonna stick with 1.75. So how are those going through? Then what are they? Are they going through together then? Yeah, they're gonna get done together. Okay, that's your. All right, Jay, what's your picture for the future of them? If they get done, I'm. I would not argue with Tim about it. I think the 1.75 sounds. We got lunch right. on it, Jay. <clears throat> well, I'll I'll buy you lunch anyway, but. <laughs> You know, ever eat lunch on Zoom? It's really wonderful. Uh, <laughs> but, but, you know, I, I think, you know, if this is going to get done, and the only reason it'll get done is that uh, McConnell lets it get done, really, <clears throat> um, then it'll be at the 1.75 and the 1.2. And yes, they will happen at the same time, because that, that's the way Biden has set it up. All right, but so, so a many convert. Things, I've got a convert. All right, you guys, listen. You know, but so many things could happen in the meantime, <laughs> any day, in every right. every way. Jim, I mean, yeah. uh, Jack, remember now, they have to take something out or reduce something to get to 175. So first, let's hear from you what's coming out and what's going to get it down to, it's easy to say 175. So how are they getting it down to 175? Jay. Well, I, we don't know. I mean, this is the big thing that Bernie was on tube about last night. We don't know what they want. And it's mansion and cinema. And you ask him and ask him and ask him. You know, I remember when I practiced law, the worst kind of negotiation was uh, where the other fellow never told you exactly what is. I mean, this is common knowledge in the world of business. He never told you what his position was. And that was essentially keep coming keep reducing your, your claim, keep getting lower and lower, and I'll tell you when I'm ready. In other words, asking you to make two offers in a row. You never win a negotiation if you have to make serial offers in a row without knowing what the other guy. So this is all being jammed up and held up by the fact that the people on the other side, the other hand clapping is not telling you their position or their expectation. So right now, it is totally stuck. That's the strategy. I mean, it's it's stuck, but it's stuck with this strategy in play from the Republicans. Okay, Tim, do well, you- That's the Democrats. Yeah. You know, um, the ABCs of negotiation is okay. you, you don't get in front of a camera and tell people what you're negotiating. Um, I, 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 I negotiated two union contracts and it almost uh, it turned all my hair white, number one. Uh, number two is you do keep your cards close to your chest. You don't reveal everything that you need to reveal. And you certainly don't get in front of a camera to do it. So the fact that they don't know what's going on, I, I'm not buying that. Joe Manchin has said in front of a camera what numbers he's looking for. Um, I don't know what Bernie Sanders is listening to or not listening to, but all you have to do is turn on an M MSNBC and you can hear Joe Manchin throw out some numbers. I've heard, I've heard it three times now from Joe Manchin. Yeah, yeah. So um, it's not the numbers per se, though, that's really an issue. It's, it's like Stephanie says, what is it? How do you get to that number? Well, what you know, what programs do you throw out? You just <laughs> have to listen to Joe Manchin. And, and, you know, he's a moderate Democrat. And there's a lot of other moderate Democrats that don't want a free, another great society that Johnson set up. Um, it took us decades to get over uh, some of the collapses of these social programs that went horribly wrong back in the, in the 70s and 80s. And, uh, you, know, you know, the old saying, I, I, I'm more willing to pay for someone to get a hand up versus a hand out. And yeah. I think that's what Joe Manchin is trying to articulate is, uh, he doesn't want an entitlement society like we had in the Great Society. What does with that Johnson. mean? That's the big question. What does that mean? What do you knock off? Well, Jay, well I think Joe Manchin is looking at the child credit thing. I, I think he's looking at um, a lot of the high ticket items that. Where is the reducing of the payment? Now, there also has been a suggestion this is Biden down from a 10 year deal to five years. Yeah, so but Joe Manchin wants means testing, and I agree with that. But that's throwing in another thing. I, I think that's kind of dead in the water. That's not becoming. A, but the point is that with bringing it down, it reduces it significantly. Also addresses your point, Tim, that it has to be renewed in five years by another round. So you do not get that fallen into the expectation that it's just going to go on forever. So what about that notion? Does that give you any more hope that this is lively? Yeah, and it's it's a nice option. I think Clyburn is the one who suggested. Uh, instead of a 10 year package, it's a five year or a three year package. And that brings the price tag way down. It's not just the price tag, Jay's right. 
I think there's elements in that package that are fundamentally uh, disagreeable with Joe Manchin. And that is, again, um, I, you know, this, this complete entitlement environment uh, that he perceives is the case. Well, and so okay. I think there's elements of the program he would like to see eliminated. Okay, I was proposing that that, that, that cutting it shorter might have addressed some of that. Um, I don't think it does. But I mean, there's, some, there's a lot of stuff on the table. This some isn't going anywhere. It is not going anywhere. The way, the way it would go, so when you sit at a table privately without the media over your shoulder, okay, and you say, Joe, what do you really want? Here's mm -hmm. a list of what's in the bill. Just make a mark, you know, about the ones you want to throw out and we get to 175 that way, you know, because Tim Apicella said we had to get to 175, okay? And, 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 and then we will, and then if we agree on the ones you check off, we go outside where the waiting cameras are. We say, we made a deal. Let's run it through. But okay. Manchin is not sitting at the table. He's exactly. not checking off the items that he really objects to. Okay. He's not helping to get to the number, whatever it is. So okay. bottom line is this is all wishy-wash. Okay. And okay. they say that, you know, it helps when Biden goes down there and talks to them and meets with them and says, now, now, boys and girls. But he's not strong enough. You know, I mean, a, a stronger president would say, come on, you guys, let's do it. And he would squash all this squab squabbling among the Democrats right away. We're going to shift to another fun topic, which has to do with the Supreme Can I just say that I agree with Jay entirely on his last comment? because it's getting repetitious. So what we're going to do is talk about the subpoena process that's in play with the January 6th committee and that they've got 11 out and they got four big numbers ready to come in, four of them that are on the hot plate right now, one they can't find. But they're seriously, are they considering alternative approaches to the subpoena than just letting them do whatever they want? Tim, what do you think? Is that going to happen? Uh, again, the Democrats are known for the old soup ladle to a gunfight routine. And if they have any authoritative powers, exercise them immediately. And, and by the way, I hear some of these things now are going to take place until the end of October. That's way too late. They've had enough time to get their documents. And for the, uh, the parties that are not responding to the deadline for the documents, use whatever authoritative powers you have and don't mess around. If you could pick them up and bring them in and force them to sit down in front of the, the committee, do so. That's what they said they would do. Jay, did you hear that they said they were going to go to the criminal intent uh, way? And even to that, with the handcuffs, they send the, the bailiff out to get them with the handcuffs. Do you see any of that as becoming a real thing? Uh, one, one of the, uh, one of the uh, I guess, one of the congressmen um, said they were considering that. One of the members of the committee said they were considering that. Um, but you know what? Think of the optics. Think of the optics with the handcuffs. I mean, it will really mm, rouse up some eyebrows. It will ex exacerbate the division in the country. People on the other side, the Trump side, will Jay? be out of their minds angry. And, well, and, would, and would, the, would the GOP a, do it? Would the GOP do it to the Democrats? Well, this is a good point, uh, Tim. They, I, they wouldn't be caught in a situation like this, honestly. Well, that's a good point. Yeah, you're right. That's true. With they, they do think ahead. All right. So this has been another um, uh, a wonderful show and very uh, participatory and, and eager eagerness to grapple with these challenges and the politics we have. It's time to close. And so uh, I've been informed. So it's Aloha time and we have to wrap it up. So um, this show um, discussion reveals uh, we're, we're witnessing how hard it is to, to rule or govern in these times. And um, I think that uh, it means uh, asymmetrical politics are in the wind and unpredictable outcomes and maneuvers and strategies are um, there and maybe sometimes not there. But thanks to Jay Fidel and to uh, Tim Apicella, we've had a really um, exciting contributions, uh, exciting conversation. <laughs> today. I am Stephanie Stoll Dalton, your host for Politics for the People. See you next week, Thursday, same time, Hawaii Standard Time, and mahalo, everyone. Aloha. Mm -hmm.